Hello and welcome to the On the Couch podcast, the podcast that gives you the view from the therapist's chair. I'm your host, John Dennis, a licensed professional counselor. You're listening to OTC episode 66 with Dr. Katherine Ramplin, author of Confession of a Serial Killer. Welcome back, OTC listeners. Thank you for joining me for another episode. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I tried to record some of the intros uh, last night, and I actually had to stop because of the cicadas. It was it was just so loud, which me personally, I actually love cicadas. Um, I, I always associate the, the noise that they make with, with summer uh, and summer vacation, so I know it it kind of creeps a lot of people out and it can be deafening and, and really distracting. So I figured I would not do that to you all and uh, wait to record another day. So um, today's episode uh, is, is one I was really interested in, in, in my, um, my path through psychology and just, you know, life and, and humanity. I've, I never really gravitated towards criminal psychology as much. I um, I know a lot of people, uh, a lot of colleagues that are always fascinated with it and really wanted to to focus on that uh, in their work and in their education. But I, I just never really did. Uh, and more so later in the last couple of years, I started to to be more interested in it and. Um, want to learn more about it and, and um, you know, just really learning the differences between serial killers and spree killers and, and mass uh, murderers or mass shooting events. And, and sadly, because it, it's, it's become so commonplace in our society, which is, is uh, especially the, the spree and, and mass killing events, is such a sad thing to say, you know, so, so devastating to acknowledge that like, oh, well, this has become so, so common that it's probably something I should learn about. Um, and I, I, I had kind of entered in through the TV show Mind Hunters, which I, I thought was amazing. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I know that it's it's done, at least for, for now. Hopefully it, it makes its comeback, but we'll see. Um, and so kind of got entry level there and learning about just the different, uh, different serial killers and um, FBI and profiling and, and some of that. And then started to move into different documentaries and uh, that's how I came across Dr. Catherine Ramsland. That, um, and I mean, you have to check her out. She is such a uh, amazing like library of information. I mean, even just like her own library of the books that she's written. She's written something like sixty plus books. Um, you hear us talk about. Um, she is the um, the director for the Master of Arts in Criminal Justice program at DeSales University. So she teaches a lot of classes. Uh, she writes a regular blog for Psychology Today. Uh, she, like I said, she's published like 60 books. Um, the one that I have here in my hands is uh, Confession of a Serial Killer. So she worked very closely with Dennis Rader, who is also known as the BTK Killer, and uh, helping to sort of, you know, put his story together and, and was able to, to write a book about it. And it's, you know, I just wanted to share just an, an excerpt from it um, because it, it, it's so fascinating. Um, but we, we were really trying to focus on just the differences between um, serial or mass and spree and... Um, what goes into psychological autopsies and, and things like that. So uh, she writes in uh, Confession of a Serial Killer, you know, I'm, I'm always intrigued by the ideas that people have formed about Dennis Rader. As they learn about this project, they make comments. Many are based on serial killer stereotypes from television. Does he speak in a monotone? After all, psychopaths lack emotions, don't they? 
Someone else insists that he must have been abused as a child. If he doesn't admit it, he's lying. Another is convinced that the so-called McDonald triad of fire setting, bedwetting, and animal cruelty is a firm precursor to a serial murder. In other words, many people believe they already know what they will read in this book. They'll be looking for confirmation. But Dennis Rader has unique qualities and experiences. He looks to role models among other serial killers, but he also diverges from them. And I, in, in sharing that, I wanted to highlight, you know, kind of that, I always think of that, uh, you know, MTV, real world, like, you think you know, or what, I forget what the show is, I'll, somebody will probably comment on that I don't know it, but, um, you know, you think you know, but you have no idea. We, we have these preformed, you know, judgments of what a person should be or how to identify. And while that is important, it's not always true. It, it sometimes has been propagated by media and um, just assumptions. And that's part of why I was so excited to talk to her is trying to unpack some of those, those myths and um, what she learned and what she took from her time working with Dennis Rader and, and just over the, the course of, of her career. So um, again, definitely you want to check out uh, her books. There, there's so many things to choose from uh, that would interest a person about, you know, just the, the, the mind of some of these individuals. Um, I hope you take something as always from the episode and thanks for checking it out. Well, on the couch listeners, I'm honored to have Dr. Catherine Ramsland uh, on the show today. So she is author of 68 books and counting. Uh, she is a professor in forensic psychology, uh, assistant provost uh, at DeSales University. So Dr. Ramsland, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to our talk. Yeah, yeah. I was super stoked when, when I reached out to you and you were, you know, able to, to be generous with your time, especially the the time I reached out to you, you know, toward the end of the academic calendar there. So thank you. You know, I've been reading through um, two of your more recent books, the How to Catch a Killer and then the uh, Confessions of a Serial Killer or Confession of a Serial Killer, excuse me, uh, that you wrote uh, with Dennis Rader. Um, so, yeah, can you kind of give me just a brief overview of how how did you come to this this side of the field or this corner of the field? Um, I, I really think it started when I was a kid and there was a serial killer operating in my hometown. Um, and as the victims, they were young co-eds, as they, you know, populated the newspapers with these photos and, you know, everybody, the community was, was very frightened. Um, friends of my brothers found the first body. So I think it, it, it drew me right in. Um, and, and it didn't, I mean, this isn't something that I aspired to do necessarily, but I began to, you know, years later when the internet kind of started taking off, uh, I started writing some things for a little website called the Crime Library, and I said I wanted to do this particular serial killer. They were just getting started, and then Court TV took them over, so all of a sudden I was writing one article after another for Court TV, to the point of where it was like 225 articles, wow. mostly about serial killers. So, you know, didn't aspire to be a serial killer expert, but became one through, you know, mostly a serendipitous arrangement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you sort of got sucked into the vortex a little bit. <laughs> but I wanted to be there. So, you yeah. know, it was, it was great work. And then uh, I went to John Jay College of Criminal Justice for a master's degree after my PhD. I was teaching philosophy at Rutgers University. And then it changed my life, like completely new direction. Now I teach forensic psychology. I'm very happy with that field, much more than philosophy, <laughs> frankly. Uh -huh. <laughs> I can barely read philosophy anymore, um, but I, I really enjoyed just this exploration of how do people become this way. So for me, it's case analysis. It's not trend analysis. 
It's not yeah. criminal justice oriented. It's psychology. Yeah. What makes what are, what is the developmental trajectory of these various types of extreme offenders? Mm -hmm. So that became very fascinating to me. Yeah, well, I think for a lot of us, I mean, and you, um, I, I had shared off air that, yeah, I had heard some of your story from a TV series that you were on, and sadly, the, the name is actually escaping me right now. Um, but yeah, you, who was the, the serial killer that had started in, in around your area? Which one was well, that? If he's not well known. His name is John Norman Collins, but the one sort of big true crime book written about him changed all the names of everybody. So, so he probably would have sort of launched out there in, in a Ted Bundy kind of way because he was a good-looking guy, an elementary ed major about to graduate <laughs> and teach little kids, and, and, uh, and then he was caught. So wow. that's what it was. Well, and, and that's something I really appreciated in in the TV series where you were interviewed and then in um, the introduction to Confession of a Serial Killer. I mean, you, you really talk about, you know, people come to this with a lot of myths and um, misperceptions and, and prejudices, and some of that is stoked by popular media of, mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, they, you know, I, I, I think um, you talk about how, well, they must speak in a monotone voice because all serial killers are, you know, sort of emotionless robots and dead inside. And um, obviously the, you know, middle-aged genius intelligence white male kind of myth. Um, but, yeah, I, I really appreciated that idea of, it, it doesn't always fit into that box, and there's there's still some some mystery to, yeah. How do people end up doing this? Yeah, it doesn't. It mostly doesn't fit into that box. Um, that box actually arose from an FBI study, where and and people who watch the Netflix series and on Mindhunter think they have an idea of how this began, but they don't because Mindhunter didn't get it right either. But they, the two FBI agents were going around doing prison interviews, and, and it, they were selecting whoever happened to be where they were at the time. So, so, and then some of them weren't very articulate or were, you know, psychotic, or so they got cut out of the study right away, mm. to the point where now we have a a population of. They, they interviewed about 36, but only 25, I think, were, were serial killers. So they had white, incarcerated, male, articulate serial killers willing to talk to them. It's kind that of a skewed demographic. <laughs> yeah, that's not representative. It's a very small sample. It's a very um, spe specific sample that doesn't represent females, black serial killers, Hispanic serial killers, et cetera, et cetera, and free serial killers who would never were caught. But so many of these myths sort of came up because they, they started to publish these studies and they got into criminology textbooks and popular media picked them up and, and various serial killer TV shows and movies and novels picked up on some of these myths. So we, we ended up thinking things like uh, serial killers are smarter than most people. Well, if you pick the smart ones, that's exactly how you think. <laughs> they're, they're smarter than most people because that's, that's who was in the, the uh, population that they were studying. Um, they want to be caught is a very um, pervasive myth. And that myth comes from, not from the FBI study, because the FBI has taken pains to try to completely undermine that myth. Mm -hmm. That myth comes from the, the, the fear of people who have no conscience. We don't like to believe that they really don't want to be caught and punished for what they did. So, so psychologists actually are responsible for this myth because they will say things like, well, when they made mistakes because subconsciously they wanted to get caught. And so that, <laughs> you know, so driving around with a body in the front seat, you know, that, that's, that's obviously a subconscious desire to be caught. It's not obvious at all. And uh, they don't want to be caught. They want to do what they get the most pleasure from doing, as most people do. So they don't want to be caught sitting in a cell um, and not having any access to their their prey. So that's one um, myth that the FBI has has actually um, talked a lot about and put on their website and whatnot. 
as you mentioned, the myth that they're all psychopaths, you know, cold, emotionless, you know, monstrous beings. First of all, most psychopaths are not even a criminals. Um, and they're certainly not necessarily murderers or serial killers, and not all serial killers are psychopaths. We have some that are psychotic. We have some who've turned themselves in who do feel remorse. That doesn't qualify for being a, a psychopath. So, yes, probably the majority are, but not all of them. So you have to make some room for the outliers, which is one of the reasons I studied Dennis Rader. He was an outlier in a lot of ways. He was a family man, a, you know, heavily involved in his church, president of his church congregation. He had a steady job, a series of steady jobs. Um, there was, a, and you know what? And I've spent like now 10, see, 11 years knowing him. Um, he, he can be amusing. He certainly gets angry. He has sorrow over the pain he's caused his family. So you know, those aren't psychopathic types of, of traits that, that we notice. So part of, it, part of what I like to do with these case studies is to show that these myths don't really work and they don't really explain much of anything. And all they do is make people falsely feel secure because they think they have the formula and they don't. Mm -hmm. And we still are learning, and we should stay open to new things rather than deciding how things must be based on past cases or flawed studies. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think also, you know, you talk about it, it sells papers or, it, you know, it gets views to have, uh, you know, these 10 characteristics are, you know, how to catch it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and... I think, uh, yeah, a lot of people, we we like things to fit into those boxes, you know, it makes yeah. us feel better to, to feel like we know, but... Yeah, we can like predict we're safe. If, yeah. if, if we think we know what they look like, we know, we know we, we'll be able to walk across to the other side of the street to avoid them. That's what we think. Sure. Well, and then going back to what you were saying, I mean, with the skewed demographic, I mean... Yeah, when you're looking at, at Ted Bundy, who, you know, arguably one of the, the first, like that was when um, media really blew up pretty huge in terms of being in the courtroom and sensationalizing things um, that way. Sure, he presents very well, very charming, very intelligent, you know, on his way to a law degree and representing himself in court. And, and then with... Well, he um, didn't have a law degree and he yeah, didn't... Yeah, he was he working really on it at the time, I think. Or yeah. <laughs> so that's another myth about Ted Bundy. Uh -huh. but, you know, he had it all together when he went to law school, and he didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and also the wanting to be caught. I mean, the um, I think a lot of times the son of Sam. I mean, the like toying with the the police. That oh, everybody does that. Um, yeah, and then of course uh, leave, leave it to us uh, in psychology to to put our own incorrect spin on it. And, yeah. I want explanations. And, you know, there are various personality types, even, you know, in our field, in law enforcement and criminology, there's a person who's a high need for closure, who wants everything nice and neat, predictable and controlled. And there are people who, who can float low need for closure, can float with ambiguity and uh, lack of answers until we really get all the data. So those are, you know, those are Personality types work, you know, well together if they appreciate each other's strengths and understand each other's weaknesses. But when you have someone who's a high need for closure, who's responsible for spinning out these these interpretations of data, that's a problem because they close things off. I mean, I had people say to me about Dennis Rader, well, he he must have had uh, he must have been. Um, abused as a kid because they're all abused as children. I said, he wasn't, and they're not, and that is a myth. But people like to cling to that because they read it in a criminology book or, or some, you know, fiction book about serial killers. So that becomes a problem because I think it doesn't allow us to stay open to the actual cases, the things themselves. And one of my degrees is in phenomenology, and I, I appreciate the idea of bracketing your, 
your preconceptions in order to let the data speak to you in in the way it actually is and not the not through your filters but it's very hard for certain personalities to lose their filters because that's what that's how they make sense of the world mm -hmm. Well, and there, I think you were referencing the, I'll, I'll just kind of read really quick from the introduction, the, you know, um, convinced that the so-called McDonald triad of, you know, fire setting, bedwetting, and animal cruelty is the, you know, a firm precursor to serial murder that, that like you said, it's not, not everybody does that. It's not a... Um, well, it, it's not even, there's not even good research to support it. It was, it was suggested by a Dr. McDonald who did a, a few... Uh, again, uh, non-randomized studies on some of his patient population, and he didn't even find any evidence to support it, but, but it's a nice, neat formula, mm -hmm. and it got into the popular media, mm -hmm. supported by certain, uh, you know, very vocal and prominent people, and it's not correct. Animal cruelty, yes, we certainly have a lot of animal cruelty in the past of serial killers, but that triad, no. And even the fire setting, it's got to be persistent, destructive fire setting, not just playing with fire a few mm -hmm. times as a kid. That's that's not what it is. But even that you don't find in the backgrounds of all, of all these cases. And even in that very small, tiny study that the FBI did, it wasn't even 50% who had these these three. So, you know, this, this myth is out there, and I hear it all the time by educated people. And I, I just, I wish people would stop. There was a master's uh, thesis devoted to looking into all the research on it. Like, there's nothing here. There's no support for this. How did this become such a popular concept? Because it's a nice, neat formula. We like threes. Uh, yes, to, to reference Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we're yeah. I mean, obviously, recently we've had a lot of. Uh, mass casualty events and and things like that, I, I did want to kind of divert for a second to just outlining for most in the general public the difference between serial and spree and, and mass. Can, can you okay. kind of speak to that? Yeah, that's it's such a complex <laughs> history. It used to, they all used to be grouped as multi, multicidal killers because it's more than more than one. And, and it became clear that categories were needed. Um, and then some and categories, definitions got changed, et cetera. So let me just give, see if I can do a nutshell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we could probably do uh, a whole episode just on that, but yeah, yeah, because I actually just wrote also a spree, a book devoted to spree killers to try to convince the FBI that they should reinstate this concept because it does have law enforcement facility. And we I wrote this with an, a former FBI profiler who was, you know, part of the FBI's decision to take this this category up. But let, let me let me back up a little bit. So I just call them extreme offenders because my class is on all all three of these. But essentially, um, the idea was that there are certain uh, types of people who who just go do one, a one incident big incident in one location or, or tightly related location. So that would be a mass murderer for or more fatalities, not victims. Because you're hearing a lot in the paper about, you know, mass slaughters or mass shooting. A mass shooting can have four wounded people, but not is, it doesn't qualify as a mass murder without the four fatalities. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of mix up, you know, on social media with this. So four fatalities in one location or tightly related locations in a relatively short period of time. Spree killers would have at least three fatalities in two or more locations uh, over over longer period. And I can't define it because, you know, these cases don't fit neatly into these categories necessarily. And um, serial killers now, if we go with the FBI's official definition, which most criminologists don't like anymore, um, it's at least two victims in two separate incidents. So you can see that they overlap. And we certainly have cases that are both. We have spree killers who became serial killers, serial killers who became spree mass. We even have a serial mass murderer for a few of those. So they certainly overlap. The, why do we have the categories? Because we're studying motivational 
aspects of them, and then also treatment and predict predictability, as well as if it's a spree killer or a serial killer, like a mass murderer, that's a one-off incident, often suicidal, but not always. So, at le but typically, you know who it is. There's no mystery here, unless they, unless they, you know, run into a mall and run out and, and, and nobody caught them. But that's pretty rare. So typically, they're just trying to make some big statement before, you know, the end or something like that. A spree killer will is very similar to a mass murder in terms of motivation. Usually, fueled by anger, um, their incidents will be linked by that precipitating incident. So, um, so there, I think of them as a mass murderer that's strung out over, <laughs> over location and, and time. So mm -hmm. you take the same kinds of motivating factors, personality, rigid, controlling, angry, uh, you know, want to make a big statement. And often we do know who the spree killer is. We just don't know where he or she is or they, because there are certainly groups of them as well. Um, and a serial killer, very different. It's really hard to predict someone who's going to become a serial killer because there's a lot of differences among them. And then maybe there'll be two incidents two nights apart, like with Gary Gilmore, for example, or maybe there'll be two incidents three years apart or five years apart. There's one in People magazine uh, yesterday who, who has maybe four in all, in all these different places and, and periods. So they're, that's very different from what you would think of as a spree killer. Again, there certainly are mixed types. There certainly is overlap. Very few people, when they're committing these crimes, think about which category do they want to go into, unless they want to be the world's worst mass murderer or the world's worst serial killer. Then they, start, then they think about, you know, what's the definition? But for the most part, they're just acting out. Um, and they might they might even think they're going to be a mass murderer, but then they, they they take off and kill somewhere else. So now they're now they've just changed categories. Mm -hmm. So it's it's complex. <laughs> I, I can understand people getting a bit confused and annoyed, especially my students. <laughs> <laughs> Come exam how, time, yes. <laughs> how loose these these definitions are, but it's in part because we're evolving in our understanding of this. For example, the FBI used to have a definition that it was at least three victims in three locations in three incidents with a cooling off period. Well, what does that mean? What's a cooling off period? And also, what about John Wayne Gacy? We had them all in one location. Mm -hmm. So he's 33 young men. That, does that not count as a serial killer? Well, not according to that definition. Mm -hmm. So they, they had to change it. In the process of changing it in 2005, they decided to remove spree killer as a category because they didn't think it had any uh, facility for law enforcement. They're wrong about that. Mm -hmm. And we make an argument in a book that we wrote, you know, looking at cases from, I think we had 43 different countries, showing that cert a certain category of spree killer, you can actually anticipate where they might go and catch them. So, that it, so there is facility in understanding the differences between mass spree and serial killer. And criminologists also think, because of the motiv motivational nuances, the differences, um, trying to understand them and trying to treat and stop them, um, you really do need the three categories. So that's my pitch for the three categories. Maybe the FBI is listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, again, it's um, you know just interesting how you know it evolves over time and changes based on you know circumstances and need and and yeah. um, research and evidence. Um, and and by the way, other countries don't necessarily accept these definitions either. So they're doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. I've seen as many as as a minimum of 10 murders before you're a serial killer. So wow. so when people, I wrote, write a blog for psychology today, and it's usually on some kind of criminal topic, and I get people, you know, what, you're wrong about this? There's only <laughs> two victims, that's not a serial killer. Like, oh, okay. uh, yes, it is. That's the metric it. system. This is the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice, okay. And, it, and maybe this is my own my own misunderstanding or, or myth, but I typically think of um, the differences in addition to what you said of uh, you know spree and mass. A lot of times seems more 
more distant, more removed, where you're, you're shooting a person uh, usually at distance, sometimes up close, but a lot of serial killers, it was more the like up close and personal, you know, strangulation with ligature or, you know, some, some torture element or things like that. Is that a misconception? Or? Well, it is because it depends on the motivational frame of the serial killer. Um, the ones who are sexually compelled do tend to want to be up close and personal. Um, but we certainly have those who use poison, who shoot, mm -hmm. who use bombs. Uh, so, um, really, it depends on what you're doing with the, in terms of understanding their motivation. So if you, and there are people who think the definition, again, here we are with the lack of clarity, that the definition of serial killer only applies to sexually motivated serial mm -hmm. killers. Yeah. And there's an entire book out there right now um, talking about the history of, of American serial killers where he did that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a great book, but I think he's, it's not quite right that these are all the American serial killers because we have other motivations, uh, a lot of other motivations. So that's, we always have to understand it within the frame of what compelled them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's going to play into the kind of weapon they choose, whether or not they have a victim type. That's another myth that they all always have the same victim type. Some do, but even Ted Bundy said, I don't know what you're talking about. I just saw a girl alone. It, she had, yeah. has opportunity. <laughs> long dark hair, and in fact, if you look at the pictures of, the, of his victims, they don't all have long dark hair parted in the middle. Uh -huh. But at the time, parted in the middle was the fashion, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But some have blonde hair, some have short hair. That's that wasn't his criteria, and he said it too. But that myth persists. Mm -hmm. Well, and and I think um, again in in some of your interviews, the the myth of, oh, well, um, women serial killers are only, you know, it's the angel of mercy or, you know, things like that. When you show that, okay, well, there are some that hasn't been the, the black widow or the angel of mercy that, that some have been, you know, anger, rage or, or sexual or, you know, and, and, um, uh, the buddy killers or, um, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So again, just kind of dispelling, the, the different myths. And I know, um, I think it was the Zodiac killer was, yeah, he would shoot, um, shoot people at, at lover's lane, um, at, at points, um, and stabbed people. Yeah. And bad people. But since we don't know who the Zodiac is, yeah. I think, depending on who you ask, <laughs> we're not even sure if there are victims we don't know about. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, that's important too. Well, kind of getting into the, the psychological characteristics, are there um, similarities across the, the three of serial spree mass in terms of psychological characteristics? Yeah. You're listening to OTC episode 66 with Dr. Catherine Ramsland, author of Confession of a Serial Killer. We'll be right back after a brief word from our sponsor. Would you like to talk to a counselor but can't find the time? Would you rather talk to someone from the comfort of your own home? If so, Parenting and Family Solutions is here to help. We now offer teletherapy to all clients who reside in the state of Pennsylvania. Using our secure portal, you can have a video session with your counselor using a laptop, desktop computer, or smartphone. Visit our website to learn more at www.parentfamilysolutions.com or give us a call at 717-602-5560 to see if teletherapy might be a good fit for you. Let us help you build a stronger family and a healthier you. Well, kind of getting into the the psychological characteristics, are there um, similarities across the, the three of serial spree mass in terms of psychological characteristics? Yeah. There are similarities between mass and spree that are, are pretty dramatic in terms of the, the anger, rigidity, um, you find visionary types of serial and spree killers where they think they're doing this in, in some righteous cause or, you know, trying to make a mark for religion or politics or, you know, something like that. 
you'll find that kind of thing much more often with mass and spree killers. Mm -hmm. And and serial killers have a lot more diversity in terms of the the motivations, the psychological type. We have male and female. We have team killers. Um, we have, it, it can be greed, profit, anger, power, no particular reason, <laughs> just about like killing today. It, that's very different from what you'll see with a mass or spree killer. But there is a subcategory of serial killer that ha where there's a lot of commonality, and that's the healthcare serial killers. So we have male and female nurses, a few male doctors, not many female doctors, but um, uh, other types of healthcare personnel or staff. Uh, they have very common motivators, but even among them, there are some differences, but they have very common motivators and very common types of methods. Um, usually, you know, there's anger there with, with female healthcare serial killers. There's often a mental health issue. So you can study them and you can even predict them. Uh, I have a whole book on them where I lay out a chapter where here are the red flags. If you are a healthcare worker and you suspect someone, here are the kinds of things we find in common to these killers. But you can't do that with serial killers as a whole. First of all, there are thousands of them around the world. So, and different countries have different motivating influences. Um, so you can't do that with serial killers, but you can do risk analysis uh, and risk projection with mass and spree because they, are, they do have a, and, and again, there'll always be outliers, but there are fewer among this type. Um, they tend to be angry, controlling, middle-aged, um, Things are going wrong, and they're reacting. They're making threats. They're arming themselves. They're, you know, they're they're. You can see almost here, here's a person who's who's ready to go. They're like a ticking time bomb. So if you're a person who who are is close to someone like that, you can begin to, if you know the signs, you can predict and also in, help to intervene. So that's one of the things, like the school killers with the with juvenile killers. Um, we have now some things set up where people can call in and say, I think somebody's, you know, he's, he's, he or she is collecting guns because you just had a female, by the way, who <laughs> went out of campus and did it. Um, so th they're collecting guns, they're, they're muttering about payback, they're, you know, they're, they're making a plan, they have a map of the, the diagram of the school, <laughs> you know, et cetera. Um, so you can begin to, to pre predict that trajectory and make an intervention. And we have done so since Columbine. Quite a few of these have been stopped because you've, you've seen where a certain person is going. That isn't true of serial killers. So you definitely see it with spree and mass, but not serial. And do you think it's because there's, there's such a wide spectrum on the on the serial killer end of just yeah motivations and types and uh, that it's much harder to to predict it's that partly the, it's partly the differences in motivation but it's also that they're more secretive i mean the the mass murder usually wants to make a big statement so you know who they are uh, pretty easily and especially if they're suicidal um we tend to, to know spree. I mean, certainly there are spree killers who have gotten away. We don't know who they were, or we do know. We don't know where they went. Certainly we have cases like that. But they're a little more visible than those serial killers who are street savvy, you know, now know how to compartmentalize so that they can have their family life, but also go out killing when they want to. So they're different. They're just, it's just a different type of offender. Well, and that was something I, that I thought was so striking uh, with with Holmes and and Dennis Rader of the, you know, obviously really thought it through and planned it out. I mean, Holmes with with you know he had the whole hotel set up and you know it had this um, almost like demon barber of Fleet Street kind of you know shoots dropping people down and and you know sort of the torture chamber um 
and you speak in, you know, confession of a serial killer about how Dennis Rader kind of, that was his role model. He sort of looked up to Holmes and wanted, you know, he, he, he more gravitated to um, a barn setting because of where he lived and had kind of thought through, yeah, the ability to like, hey, this is, this is great. I can, <laughs> I can do this and then, you know, be a family man and go about my life. Right. Um, I don't think he could have put a train and train track inside a dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, when I read that, I was like, wow, that's okay. That's ambitious. <laughs> yeah, when he, he drew for me a silo with with all the torture, the layers of torture devices and whatnot, and there's a train right there at the bottom. I'm like, okay, but it can't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very short ride. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was so fascinated uh, to hear, you know, yeah, you, you, um, you know, you spent five years working with him and you describe in, in the book, you know, this, his um, very kind of cagey and um, cryptic, because, you know, some, um, practically because of the um, uh, prison system and the, and the fear of, you know, somebody getting a hold of it and profiting off of it. Um, and kind of having to work your way into and, um, you know, the sort of cipher that he had created and you described that, you know, it was like not always coherent where like it was really difficult for you to kind of piece it together. Yeah. What what was working with him like? Yeah. Well, I mean, that early stuff, which is chapter one of the book where he poses the challenge to me. First of all, he forgot his own code, so that, that didn't help anything. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he There put, goes the he, mastermind theory. Yeah, he yeah. Half of it to another person and half of it to me. So we had to kind of piece it together. And it, it was a it was from for me, it was a test. Will you play? Mm -hmm. Are you gonna do what yeah. I want you to do? Of course I'm gonna play. I'm looking at this. It's a gold mine. <laughs> you know, and, and I even was was told by one of the detectives who had worked on the case, you know, you didn't make him tell you the truth. And I said, I, I didn't want him. I want him to t tell truth and lies. I'm studying all the behavior. I'm not the detective forcing him to, you know, confess. I'm the person looking at all the layers, the blind spots, the dimensions of who this person is. If he lies, fine. I don't care. If he manipulates me, that's behavior. That's why I played chess with him, because I would, I didn't care if I lost. I wanted to see what he did with certain moves. So that was the whole point for me, was looking at every aspect of his behavior, including the codes, the challenge to me, the, the sort of, um, you know, egotistical, I'm, I'm the code maker, <laughs> see if you can get through the gate. And in the end, I ended up making the code that we would use by luring him into using metaphors that I knew he would like. Hmm. And he did like them. And we ended up using my stuff, which is ironic because he didn't, one of his motivating influences was he disliked being controlled by women. But there I was, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, imagine, yeah, you get the that what was it like question. I mean, I, mean, I, I know people conjure up that, you know, um, Silence of the Lambs, Clarice right. sort of, <laughs> you know, images. I, I know you talk in, um, in the book how, you know, a lot of it was, yeah, writing letters back and forth. And um, so... Yeah, what what do you what do you take from that experience of of working with him? Yeah, how did that uh, educate you or shape your research on this topic? Yeah, well, and and in a way, I also collected experiences from another number of other people who immersed in this kind of thing. Um, most of them weren't psychologically savvy, like I've been a counselor, you know trained in all kinds of psychological mechanisms. But um, I think getting the perspective on Raider of being very clear what the boundaries were, watching his spin master thing. Do you want, do you want, me, do you want me to stop? I don't know what's no, going No, no, uh, keep going, please. I don't want okay. to interrupt you.
Okay, so watching the way uh, Raider would try to manipulate, and then we, and he, many people get the idea that they're monsters 24 seven, but they're really not. They're monsters within the frame of, of the, when they're with their victims. But I mean, Raider's daughter has written a book. She talks about him being a great father. Um, Lots of other serial killer relatives say similar things. Not always. Sometimes they're nasty guys just all through and through. But quite often, they're not the constant monster. Even Ted Bundy talks about that. He says, that, and he and Raider almost have the same phrase, I'm a good guy who did some bad things. And that's often how they think of themselves. And sometimes they think their bad things are the right thing to do. Like Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, thought he was doing the police a favor by getting rid of sex workers. So, so we, you know, you have all these different aspects. With Raider, um, he really just thought he was a good guy who did these bad things, and he hoped, you know, that, to impress me in that way. So he's genial, um, funny. We watched TV shows together and talked about them. They became great metaphors for the book because some of the shows that we both picked, like The Walking Dead, Bates Motel— the Americans, these were great shows that were really nicely metaphorical of who he thought he was. And it was very easy to, to use those as part of our code for talking, um, because even the phone calls that we had are recorded. Anybody can be listening. But I think for the most part, it was not difficult for me to talk with him um, either face to face or on the phone or read the letters. Occasionally it got a little much and I would, you know, then I would have my support group, which is my friends who can tolerate this kind of thing, you know, share the burden. You guys have to know this too. It's like, you can't see <laughs> this. So you guys have to look at too. Um, oh, and you. I always recommend <laughs> true crime writers get themselves that kind of support group because sometimes it can, it can get overwhelming. But for the most part, it was not difficult. He, unlike some serial killers with other authors, he was respectful of boundaries. Um, the one time he broke through and called me at a, the wrong time, he, he was apologetic, but I think you need to know this, just, you know. So he was not vulgar. I've seen that with other people. He did not call me at night. He did not, uh, you know, run up the tab. Uh, any or ask me for money, any of that stuff that I've seen with other killers who who work with other authors. So I was, I think, fortunate in that he did actually. I think he appreciated that uh, you know my credentials first of all for looking at him and and helping him work his way through this. But we read some tough books about violence. Um, I asked him to apply this to himself, and you know, to his credit, he worked at it. He did work out, and I thought he had some really interesting insights. Wow, yeah, it's so amazing. The almost the, um, the you know the therapeutic like relationship to it, as well as the the yeah. informational and the research side of it. So that that's that's so cool. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad you you addressed that the self care side of things because yeah, I imagine that's a question you get all the time is like, do. how do you wade into this and not you know get affected or you know and obviously you do it it's you know part of the occupational hazard quote unquote um, so it it's good to hear that yeah you have that support system that you're able to to go to um, mm -hmm. the the one. Um, psychological characteristic I had wanted to to ask about was um, at least for Dennis Rader and I'm not sure if, if if it's all serial killers but it seems like a lot have that very rich fantasy life that that they are um, really um, fantasizing about a lot of these things a lot is that accurate it is accurate although I think as they age, and you know, the hormone levels come down in terms of, of the pressure on, on the libido. Um, I think it's a little less, but yeah, that, that's where they live. But you know what? So do writers, I gotta say. I live mostly in my fantasy life too, so, and I'm not killing anybody. So, so I think that there are people who have a very vivid imagination. There are even people that we call fantasy prone, where the fantasies are more real to them so much so that they can actually 
imagine themselves having an allergy to poison ivy. They don't, and their 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 skin can blister even though they don't have the actual allergy. So so we've certainly seen interesting psychological phenomena with with the the continuum of people who are engaged with their fantasy life. And I think almost every fiction writer is going to tell you they're highly engaged with it. Um, which, and and their, their relatives are going to tell you the same thing. They're always at, at some distant place. I can't reach them. So I think the serial killers are kind of on that continuum. And again, it's usually the sexually compelled ones, not the greed compelled, not the anger compelled. Um, so the sexually compelled serial killers tend to have a very active fantasy life, but not all of them, because some of them, or, or else they just don't want to say, and I, I guess I don't blame them for that, but sometimes they just don't have much imagination. They just have the compulsion to do it. Sure. And, and with the ones that do have that component, the, the rich fantasy life, I guess I almost see it as a... Um, building over time. And I know, uh, Dennis Rader talked about that of like, I had hoped to control it. And then in the end, wasn't able to, and the sort of like, almost like exposure therapy of like, they were shaving down the barrier between the fantasy life and then reality. Um, the more they fantasized about it and then went grew to act on it. Is that yeah, I think Rader uh, gave us some really interesting insight there. Like I think he used the metaphor of leaving shore, you know, but he always thought sure he could get back to shore, which is, based, you know, the, his other self. And then one day he turned around, it was gone. And he, and he, he didn't realize that that could happen. So I think he gave some really interesting insights on the evolution of his, um, the murder part. And I also love his cubing concept, which I think is actually superior to the psychological concept of compartmentalization. Because with compartmentalization, where you have, and it's not multiple personality disorder, but it's the ability to manage different faces like an actor taking on different roles. But the cubing is interesting because you are the cube, but you have various faces on each side of the cube. And you can just shift it as circumstances call for, being a father, being a thief, being a killer, being a president of your church council, whatever the circumstance calls for, you can put that face on, but the, all the other sides of the cube are still you. And I think that was that was a brilliant concept. He thinks I came up with that. I did not. He came up with that, and I'm attributing it to him. And I think he didn't even realize how how brilliant it really is. But I but that's one of the things that came out of our discussions. Yeah, I, when I came across it myself, yeah, I, I was you know just kind of taken aback by the. Uh, and I'll likely use that in my therapy with clients of that, you know, the different faces of it, because I, I often use more of the the, um, the pie chart, uh, you know, sections of like A, B right. and C, the church self or the work self or, you know. Right. Um, yeah. Put it on a cube. Try it. Put it on a cube. I, I make that for my class. Yeah. Uh, you'll see how interesting it is in terms of when you turn. Turn it, and especially if they're psychopathic, because their their emotional commitment to any given side is very shallow, because mm. they don't really care what the truth is. They only care what's useful. So when you put it on a cube, an actual physical cube, you'll see how interesting the concept is. Yeah, yeah, wow. That's uh, thank you so much for you know that and more. You know, be putting in the work with him and and everything that's come from that. Um, so in, in terms of, I, I often ask uh, my guests, you know, if, if you were head of, you know, the government, uh, <laughs> you know, the position for mental health or behavioral health, what'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> what'd you say? How do you know I'm not? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, in this hypothetical, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, if you were head of, you know, mental or behavioral health for the country, um, are there certain steps that you would take or things you would implement to, yeah, to try to help us detect or put a stop to some of, some of these individuals uh, forming? Yeah. It would be so difficult because of our history of, of um, you know, the civil 
liberties, the civil rights of people, that they should be able to say no to being institutionalized. And, you know, we have such a complex history with mental illness, with how we're spending taxpayer money, with, you know, large institutions versus community centers. And so many people have fallen through the cracks as a result of that. So I think I think the problem it's not just getting more money and throwing more money at treatment centers or or but being able to identify those treatments no matter what the cost that are genuinely effective. Hmm. Um, for example, the Mendota Juvenile Center in Wisconsin working with you know boys adolescent boys who are at risk for becoming adult psychopaths who have been basically failed in every other place they've been, are actually making progress and not recidivating, or at least recidivating at a much lower rate and in a much less violent manner than, you know, similar populations. So if you, but it's a very expensive program because it's very one-on-one. -on -one. It's very focused on the, you know, counseling to, to kid. And as a result, it's, it seems expensive, but in the long run, it's less expensive to society as a whole. So that's, so we have to identify those and, ex, you know, accept the investment of taxpayer money to save on money in the future. But that's a hard thing to, to sell to, to taxpayers because they want to see results right now. And that's just not how it works. It's the American way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The American way. So that's why I think even if you had all the money, it's still, it's still going to be ineffective because you'll get scammers. You'll get people who claim their treatment works and it doesn't. I think it's, I think it's a hard question. That's why I'm not a sociologist. I am actually in psychology. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, and, and, you know, some of that, you know, what, what's your definition of cost of like, okay, if, if we manage to stop um, somebody from becoming that, the, the cost to society and humanity. And um, yeah, I kind of, uh, in preparing to ask you that question, I kind of thought it through myself and I was like, so the only, I mean, the only logical way then is to turn it into minority report. And, you know, you're like, predicting crime before it even happens and, you know, <laughs> trying to, trying to get and into then, that. And then what do you do? Take them off the street and put them in pods. I mean, yeah. and I, I use that movie in my class when I talk about risk associate risk, um, Prediction trajectory error, yeah. because, because that's, that's the only, so, so let's say we can make these predictions. Now what, what are you going to do? Let's yeah. say we can make them Just lock them up the, and throw away the key or yeah. What are you going to do? May force people to abort because they're because now we can tell genetically that their child is at risk for becoming you know some violent person. If we get to that point, we have to face these questions, and there are a lot of ethical questions involved. The same thing with all the brain research we're doing and the brain scans and talking about wow, we're seeing the differences in the brains of psychopaths from ordinary people. Well, again, psychopaths aren't always violent, so you have to be very careful with what you're going to say and do about this. So. It's, I think it's a very difficult question. And we're right back to philosophy and ethics. And Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, again, it, it, it's, uh, it's a never-ending uh, rabbit hole to kind of need is. to go down. Um, um, you also, yeah, you, you, uh, you teach and you consult on, on death investigations. I would wanted to ask about that side in terms of psychological autopsies, what is that? How is it conducted? Yeah, can you can you kind of describe your work with that? Okay, well, a psychological autopsy is most effective when you have um, ambiguity as to the manner of death. So manner of death is um, natural, accident, suicide, homicide, and undetermined. And undetermined can be as you know high as 20% or wrongly determined. You think it's a suicide when, in fact, it's an autoerotic asphyxiation accident. That's two big, very, very different things, especially when it, for insurance payouts. <laughs> so so um, the psychological autopsy dives deep into the person's mental state in a way that, that 
detectives, police are not trained to do. So you, you usually would team up with, with a mental health expert or what we call a suicidologist. Many people have not even heard of that. But a suicidologist has studied the, the field of suicides and the multiple ways that people have elected to end their lives and the reasons why, as well as the, the people who've survived serious attempts and what they've had to say. So a person who, who has that kind of expertise can assist detectives with um, looking at an incident that seems to be going in more than one way, and they're not really sure what call to make, especially coroners. So I do work with a, a local coroner, and I've consulted on, with a few other uh, other coroners in other jurisdictions on cases that were difficult and, you know, might look like one thing, but if, if you add some psychological factors, look like something else altogether, or might be a staged crime. So it looks like a suicide, but in fact, there are items that show maybe somebody killed this person in a stage of this suicide, or a, a, the person themselves wanted it to look like a homicide, but they're killing themselves, but they want their family to have the insurance. So, you know, there, there are multiple different options that someone with some expertise in the, the suicide area of psychology can assist law enforcement with closing this case and helping families, and especially with insurance uh, companies and whatnot. So the psychological autopsy is just diving deeper into the psychological components of a death incident to help establish what is the manner of death. Hmm. And are you finding that's that's um, being done a lot a lot more? I guess I would say in terms of like a, across the country that the that not, I don't want to say a growing trend, but yeah, is that, um, uh, it I, isn't, uh, I do t train coroner groups and death investigation, you know, homicide officers and whatnot in it. But the, one of the problems is c teaming up with a professional because if they charge a lot, <laughs> cause these are pretty intensive, they can take a lot of hours, sure, you know, sure. there's no money and I do it without charging because it get, it gets, you know, there's a quid pro quo. I get material for the death investigation class that I teach. Mm -hmm. I also wrote a textbook on, on the psychological aspects of death investigation. So there's a, a you know, some trade-off here. They, I, I help them and, you know, I get some benefit from it. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, if you're hiring a licensed clinical psychologist to do your death incident evaluation, you can expect to pay a lot of money and the money isn't there. Sure. So yet another, uh, uh, yet another thing you would institute if you were the head yeah, of. <laughs> okay. Would, yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, again, uh, there's, uh, so many, I, I wish I could talk to you all day long, uh, cause <laughs> and have, you know, just multiple episodes cause there's so many things. Um, so where where can people find you? Where where can people find your work? Mostly I'm, you know, I have a, a pretty active Facebook page, a couple of them. I have a, a fans of Catherine Ramsland for all the writing and stuff. And and now I'm launching into some Hollywood things. I'm an executive producer of Murder House Flip, which was my idea. It came out of one of my classes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so we're we're sort of moving on that and um you know, so so I talk a lot about it on that site. Other my other Facebook page, just my name. I don't do a lot with Twitter, but I'm I'm there. You can find me there. I do not have a website anymore. I just found the management of it was taken away from my writing, and so you know mm -hmm. that had to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so right now, and I'm and I'm writing a novel about a forensic psychologist who it had, manages an investigation agency. And specializes in suicidology, so I hope that goes. When when do you sleep? Um, when, when does <laughs> that happen? Sleep is very important to be able to do all these things. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. Yeah, I, 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 listeners have heard me rant and rave about uh, sleep psychosis and how yeah. important sleep is all the time because I, I have small children. So <laughs> exercise and sleep. You got to get both of those to be productive. Yeah. Wow. So I, I will uh, really look forward to staying in touch with you uh, and just, you know, keeping an ear out for the different things that you're working on. In terms of the the executive producing side of things, 
do you have a, a projected launch? I know with uh, it's, it Co launched. It launched on Quibi, a okay. streaming service that went down, you know, to the pandemic. Yes. But Roku purchased it, and they are they have a Ro uh, their own channel on the Roku device, and they're doing original programming, and and our our show comes back in tomorrow. Oh wow! Wow! <laughs> and then we get a second season, so I'm it was very popular. It, so May twentieth. Yeah, so it, essentially you take a house where a murder happened and we go in and do the de redesign and, and make them feel much better about their home. And, you know, so that's basically what it is. It's HGTV meets CSI, I guess. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that is a pretty cool idea. I've, I've yeah. often thought of that, of not, not that idea, but yeah, the wondering like, yeah, who buys that? I, I know that there are people that love the notoriety of the, you know, well, I, I have that house, you know, and love that aspect of the, you know, the darker side of, um, you know, some of the, um, uh, I'm thinking of like, you know, just people that are almost like a groupie for serial killers. Right. Um, but yeah, so I've, I've often wondered. The house and we're not told that yeah. this happened. Because the laws only go back three years. And in some, like in Pennsylvania, they only have to tell you if um, you ask. <laughs> so wow. there's, actually, there's actually a website <laughs> side in the house. You can, you can hire them to tell you if some incident happened in your house. Uh, yeah. but, there, but one of our first houses was actually Dorothy Puente's house. And she was a female serial killer who murdered her boarders to take their yeah, social security yeah, payments social security and, and buried them in the yard. Wow. So the people who had the house didn't really want to change the house because they loved the, the notoriety. So I said, well, I bet you want a new yard. Yeah. <laughs> and they did. And we gave them a fabulous new place. So so they were very, very happy. Yeah. Um, so, so many other <laughs> questions just came up. <laughs> yeah, the how upset I would be as a, as a new buyer, especially in today's market where, like, you never told me there was, like, a, a, well, a serial killer. Well, you never asked. <laughs> yeah, and, there were, and there were two. We had two couples. We had four houses in our first season, and two of the couples found out from neighbors. Oh, my gosh. And some were really horrific. Like, a guy was caught boiling his dead wife in a, you know, in a pan in the kitchen. So some were really awful. And, and here they are now. They can't just move. Yeah, so you're stuck with a house. <laughs> They got beautiful makeovers. I mean, I would almost kill. No, I wouldn't. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't work for to inspire people because they get just fabulous makeovers in these houses. But the idea is that you—it's not the house's fault yeah. that this happened here. And one of the one of the shows actually had a ghost story attached to it as well. Hmm. So it's not the house's fault. So we're remaking it so you feel differently about it. And that's the idea. And in, in follow through, they've all been very happy and, and said it really did make a difference. So that's the yeah. Good show. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, listeners, you can catch it on on Quibi and Roku and not Quibi. Quibi's gone. Oh well, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> totally went under. It's on Roku now. <laughs> yep. Uh. Well, Dr. Ramsland, thank you again for, for sharing of your time and your expertise. Uh, you just added so much uh, to the, the world of psychology and just our society and, and being willing to, to move into this and, and dig deeper. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I yeah. enjoyed it. Take care. Okay. You too. Thanks again for stopping by, OTC listeners. Next episode will be OTC episode 67, where I'll be talking with Dr. Jenny Wang about mental health in the AAPI community.